uh, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we give you thanks for this chance to be together, this chance to reflect upon some of the beauty of our faith, this chance to uh, be encouraged uh, by one another as we strive to both understand and live our faith more authentically each day. Be generous with your grace in our lives. Be generous with your grace in the lives of those that we know and love and care for, especially the young people we serve in youth apostles. We ask this prayer humbly through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So a little girl was talking to her uh, public school teacher about whales. And the teacher said that it was really physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human being. Uh, they're, while they're very large beings, they don't have a big throat, and they actually eat tiny little microorganisms, and so um, they can't swallow a whale. And the girl said, well, you know, she was very convinced that, uh, that Jonah had been swallowed by a whale. And the teacher said again, you know, I'm sorry, honey, but it just really isn't impo it's not possible. And the girl said, well, it's really a clear story in, in the Bible. And, and so finally the girl said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And uh, the teacher said, well, what if Jonah went to hell? And she paused for a second and she said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. Uh, so. Um, I have uh, chosen to offer this series of reflections upon the Beatitudes for three reasons. I've already told you this, but I'm going to tell you again. Um, they are critical to understanding the gospel way of life and, and uh, the, the new way that Christ has given to us as Christians. They are hard to understand and even paradoxical, and so... Um, they, they um, are something that most people just choose not to address because they're not easy to understand, right? And um, the third reason is because they share with us a wisdom that comes from God that, uh, while paradoxical, is life-giving. And so um, we're reflecting upon the Beatitudes. And I want to turn to a, another favorite author of mine, <clears throat> Peter Kreft, in his book, Back to Virtue. Um, again, I, I think most of you are aware that I've been spending a lot of my time focusing on the eight doors of the kingdom uh, by Father Jacques Philippe, and he's guiding a lot of my reflections. Um, but another author that I love greatly who has spoken about the, the Beatitudes is uh, Peter Kreft in, in this book, Back to Virtue. I like it a lot. And this gives you a little taste of uh, his style and his, his ability to kind of get to things uh, very well. And so because this has been a year-long process, I, I want to keep kind of going back to some of the basics, right? So um, why are we studying the Beatitudes? And what is Beatitude? What does it mean to be blessed, right? So he says... Blessedness, beatitude, is what all of us are seeking all the time, in and by everything we seek. Blessedness is always our end, whether our means is pleasure or power or riches or wisdom or honor or anything else. Blessedness is the summum bonum, the greatest good. Everyone seeks it, but not everyone finds it because not everyone knows where it is. St. Augustine says, seek what you seek, but it is not where you seek it. Not everyone has a road map. Jesus here gives us the road map for our lives. This is the greatest of all treasure maps to the greatest of all treasures and it is given to us absolutely free. 
So blessedness in the end is what every single one of us is seeking in the depths of our being. Now, he's going to argue a point that I agree with, but it disagrees a little bit with Jacques Philippe. So here's a little, an interesting thing. He says, this treasure they point us to us, the, the Beatitudes, is not just happiness, but blessedness. Some modern versions of the Bible translate the word makarios as happy. This is a fundamental and disastrous mistake. Father Jacques Philippe uses happiness. Um, in fact, it includes three mistakes. For happy means to the modern reader something subjective, a state of consciousness, a feeling. If you feel happy, you are happy. It also connotes a temporary state and something dependent upon fortune. I didn't remember this. Hap, for happy. Hap in the old English is the old English word for fortune or chance. Blessedness, on the other hand, is an objective state, not a subjective feeling. So we can be mistaken about it. In fact, most of the world is. That's why Jesus has to teach us, even shock us. Blessedness is also a permanent state. It's something that God wants us to have no matter what's going on around us. And it is dependent upon God's grace and our choice, neither chance nor fortune. So um, just kind of going back to the basics here in terms of why the Beatitudes and what is blessedness. With that in mind, today we're covering blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. So justice, too, is a divine quality. So in the Psalms 145, the Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. In the book of Deuteronomy, the rock, with a capital R, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and right he is. So God makes no exceptions, but treats everyone with absolute equality. We struggle with doing that. We just can't do that. But God can, because he's really big. And humankind must stand before God in a relation of truth with no excuses. This is part of what justice is. So justice is, above all, a concern about our relationship with God. And this is how things, I think the faith shocks us sometimes. So you cannot fully understand justice or apply it to your neighbor without a reference to God. There is a very deep link between the truth of our relationship with God and justice towards one's neighbor. In the famous passage from Matthew 25 about the last judgment, Jesus declares very clearly that what we have done or not done to the least of our brothers, we have done to him. Justice toward others is a measure of our relationship with God. And the primary aspect of hunger and thirst for justice is then simply a true desire for holiness, which is the love of God that spills over into our love for our neighbor. So part of justice, too, then, is that it becomes a desire for the salvation of all. God's justice is geared towards salvation. Jesus came into this world to save. That's what his name means. He came to save. And he came to save us by restoring a right relationship with God, a just relationship with God, and, of course, with our neighbor. And so uh, in Titus, you know, uh, chapter 2, 
For the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men. God wants all human beings to be saved without question. In the book of Revelation, after this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And so part of justice is having actually an ardent desire that God's salvation be realized for every human being. Um, the great need for justice in our world is one more a very powerful expression, actually, of our great need for prayer. And so, uh, it, again, most of the time when we think of justice, we're totally thinking about, you know, whatever, judges, lawyers, social justice, and that's not where we should begin. That's one of the main points that I want you to hear today. So one of the most important expressions of the thirst for justice is actually prayer. Interestingly, when Jesus speaks to his disciples about the need for persevering in prayer, if you remember this story, it's a great one, he tells a parable about a widow who is praying for justice from a judge. And Jesus wants us to pray persistently like she did. And in the end, she gets a just decision from a judge who was otherwise heedless of a God and man. So prayer nurtures our personal and dynamic relationship with God. That's, that's so fundamental and critical, we understand that. But prayer opens the door to our stony hearts. Remember in one of the great passages in the Old Testament that God wants to take away our stony hearts and give us hearts of flesh become stony through life sometimes, right? Prayer opens our mind to the wisdom and plans of God. Prayer molds and shapes our whole being so that we see with God's eyes this world. And we begin to actually desire and will what He desires and wills in this world. And so genuine prayer makes us more sensitive to the needs of our neighbor and drives us out to seek justice for all who are hurting. But it's not going to go properly unless it's rooted in God. Justice will not be delivered to the world properly unless it is rooted in God because He is the just one. And He teaches us what true justice is. I hope I'm not offending all the lawyers here today. So the thirst for justice also flows from a commitment to the truth. And so uh, we first enter into the process of living in the truth before God. And so when we are praying, when we are drawing closer to God, we slowly begin to refuse all forms of illusion and self-deception. Slowly. Sometimes very slowly, right? All the lies that we make to ourselves, all the compromises, all the close enoughs that we say to God and to everybody around us, right? We become more and more willing to place our lives in their entirety, not just little portions or sections or, you know, uh, boxes of our life. We place our lives in their entirety under the light of God, and we have the courage of truth to do that. People who make the most progress in the spiritual life are not necessarily at the beginning the most virtuous or devout. They are the ones who insist on being honest with themselves and truthful with God. They are the ones that are going to make the most progress in the end. Only the truth makes us free. Something that we say a lot in youth apostles is going back to John 8. If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Nothing else sets us free. So, a question that we have to ask ourselves today, I think, is 
what do I really hunger and thirst for? What do I really hunger and thirst for in life? What is the greatest desire of my life? St. Paul and our beloved St. Ignatius would teach us that we need to discern the voices and the spirits and the desires that come at us, both from the world and from within. We get bombarded both from the world and from within regarding desires and, and thoughts and voices and whatever. And in prayer, we learn to discern which voices are coming from God and which voices are coming from somewhere else. Maybe just our own selfishness, but sometimes perhaps even the devil. And we've got to discern what's coming from God, right? And so um, then we get to the bottom of our heart and what it is that I am truly desiring and what should I truly be desiring. I want to take a note of three moments when Jesus thirsted. And the first was when he fasted for 40 days and nights at the start of his public ministry. That time was spent in the starkness of the desert, nurturing his relationship with the Father and helping him prepare to fully understand what it was to be a human being and to relate to us. And so he deeply thirsted, right? And then he became tempted. One of the temptations was to, you know, solve this hunger and thirst uh, in a way that would not be according to God's will. Secondly, when he asked the woman at the well for a cup of water, we know that he did not need water. I mean, physically he probably did, but that wasn't the point. The point was that he was thirsting for the heart and the soul of that as God. And then thirdly, um, Jesus uh, thirsted from the cross. That I thirst of Jesus uh, from the cross, once again, it was the result of probably not even having had any water for quite some time. It was. But there's no doubt that in that instance, Jesus unquestionably meant something so much different. That he, from the cross, was thirsting for the soul of every human being ever created. Because he made every one of us out of love. And he wants every one of us to be with him for all eternity in heaven. And so from the cross, I thirst for every one of you in this And Mother Teresa, whom, if you don't love her, I'll shoot you afterwards, right? She is the best. And Mother Teresa put I thirst on the wall next to the cross of every chapel she built around the world. Because Mother Teresa shared that thirst. And that's why she loved the poorest of the poor all over the world and took in those who were dying and loved them until they died it was because she shared the thirst of Christ for this world. So I'm going to finish with just recognizing that that the relationship that Jesus had with his Father and the beauty of the Holy Trinity, Jesus had it right. And I, I encourage you to just page through one gospel today. Just pick up your, pick up your Bible, page through one gospel. Just, just read the titles. I think you will be amazed at how much time Jesus spent with those who were hurting. Those on the fringe, the outcasts, the sinners, everything that we think of when we think of justice and social justice. And it is extremely important. But it was because 
this sounds funny, but he was in a right relationship with God, and that drove him to love others. And so St. Vincent de Paul, great patron of, of the poor, I hope to visit his tomb in October. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, in our own country, had this burning hunger to give education to young people, a, patron, a saint of our land. St. Catherine Drexel, Beautiful focus on immigrants and native peoples in this country. Poured out her life. Established like 200 institutions by the time that she died. A hunger and thirst for justice. St. Teresa of Calcutta. And so for the saints, their extraordinary love for God drove them to seek justice for their Father Jacques Philippe will say, says in the book, one of the greatest injustices in all of history is ultimately that God is not loved as he should be. That he is so forgotten, so neglected, that human beings take little notice of their creator and savior. So in the end, to hunger and thirst for justice means ardently desiring that God be better known and loved, a reality which in turn leads to ardently desiring that our neighbor be better known and loved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.